Hi everyone, welcome to today's Cheap TV. We have a jam-packed show for you today, so make sure you stick around because you don't want to miss a minute of it. We go through step six on the seller's 10 point checklist, which is all about meeting the support team who play a big role in the sale of your home. We also take a look at what a financial planner does and how they can assist you in the purchase or the sale of a house. We go to Turak Gardens to take a look inside one of South Australia's finest homes. And at the end of the show, we'll be answering all of the real estate questions you've sent in throughout the week and during the show. So if you have any, make sure you get them in now. A really great show today. We are covering a lot of ground. And summer is here, it's been a really busy season. The amount of stock level has been huge. Uh, and we're going to go through a lot of the details, the dynamics of that, because we have RP Data's Cameron Cusher online shortly. And we'll answer those questions right up front and it'll be absolutely current. So I can't wait for that discussion during the show. Now the inside story on why homeowners are holding on to homes for longer, let's go and have a look at that right now. It's news that may not please real estate agents, but it's been found Australian homeowners are staying put for longer. Over the past five years, the average length of time vendors held onto their houses increased by 1.7 years and for units, it was 1.4 years. This has been attributed to property owners awaiting capital growth and the resulting boost to equity, or vendors failing to sell and withdrawing their homes from the market. Many believe current economic conditions are to blame for a slump in sales. I think it's because of the high interest rates and people just haven't got as much income. Maybe it's price, maybe it's interest rates. Hard to say. Well, it sounds like the primary reason is they haven't got enough money. <laughs> They're all getting a bit expensive. Certain places are going up and how, do you, how can you afford to get in there? We're still earning the same amount of money in our jobs. Look, people want to buy, but that's what puts them off, you know? You know, young families just can't afford to go into houses that are 500, 600,000 and pay the interest rates for them, and that's the problem. While on the other hand, there are some common mistakes homeowners make which can halt the entire sales process. These issues are receiving bad advice on market conditions and pricing, poor presentation of the property, a weak marketing campaign, the salesperson giving up, or the seller having unrealistic expectations. So if you have a property that hasn't sold yet, try checking these five points, as there's a good chance one or more of these factors needs to be changed. It's been a really interesting period this year. A lot of discussion with interest rate rising, a lot of discussion about affordability. So we're actually doing this financial series and we've got Phil Ely later in the program. And joining me today is one of uh, Phil's um, counterparts, I guess you'd say, but different specialists in different areas. And he's the director of Thornton Group, Duncan Week. Welcome, Duncan. Thanks, TV. Good to be here. Now, just to get underway, your footy preferences, mate. Oh, it has to be port, doesn't it? One, <laughs> one port. One we, port. We run into each other uh, quite a bit down there. Um, Duncan, who is Duncan professionally? What do you do? Uh, financial planner with the Thornton Group. Uh, we're a boutique financial planning company on Green Hill Road. Uh, Specialise in investments, risk management, portfolio management. Right. Now, I've had uh, Phil on uh, and we've seen him uh, directly after this mm -hmm. and he's a financial planner in, in a similar space. Uh, but I really want to drill down now on a couple of very specific areas of property where uh, owners of of homes, yep. whether they currently own them, or whether they're about to get a redundancy package or a retirement package, how they can not just make money out of uh, the property, but make money out of tax advantages and that, that we need to keep it really simple. Sure. So let me, let me ask you a simple question. How do you make money out of property from a tax and finance perspective? Who are the people that have got an opportunity to cash in on the back of tax concessions? Okay. I th a lot of people don't actually realise that they can actually use their superannuation funds to buy property, for, as in for investment purposes. And that's, that's one thing that we've found uh, is an opening market, particularly those that are moving into their 40s, uh, that like to buy a long-term asset where they think that there is long-term growth. Um, we can actually structure it quite rel relatively easily through the superannuation fund. Now, it's become a really specialist field, yep. and um, that's why I wanted both Phil and yourself to talk to us about it. Your take on um, who, who would benefit most from hearing the detail, we don't want to hear the detail today, but hearing the detail about the advantages, um, would it be someone with $100,000 um, equity or money, 200, 500 million, 
Where, where does it kick in where you guys can really make a difference? I think uh, we can make a difference right through uh, the investment cycle for someone, but self-managed funds are probably best suited for those that have probably have about 400,000 odd sitting in their fund. Okay. And the only reason for that is it gives them some scale and some diversity of their investments. A lot of people like property because you can touch it, feel it, see yep. it. Can you still touch it, feel it, see it by doing it this way? Yes. Yeah, most people that have self-managed funds do it for that reason. They like the idea of control, they like the idea of transparency of the fees, uh, they like the idea of seeing their investment physically. So yeah. So how would the fees vary on a typical, let's say you had a $400,000 home that you bought hmm? and you had it in a super fund. Give me, what does the picture look like? What does the fees cost to you guys? What are the benefits for the person that owns it in a super fund rather than just owning it? in their own name. Okay, the big kicker is actually the, the tax structure. There's, to set up a self-managed super fund probably costs less than $1,000. Okay, so that's, right. that's low. Um, depending on how you structure that, whether you want a company as the trustee or the individuals as the trustee. Uh, ongoing, that uh, depends on the level of complexity on what the advisor charges. Um, but accounting for a super fund is probably in the order of two, two and a half thousand dollars a year. And then the vehicle, the super fund is ultimately used as a vehicle to actually own an investment. And okay. so it depends on in whether there's debt required or not. If there's debt required, we add another level of a layer of complexity. To right, it. okay. So you can actually, say you had $400,000 of equity, yep. you could borrow some money to buy maybe a $500,000 property? Yes, definitely, definitely. Right, okay. Because that wasn't possible before? No, no. Super funds didn't have the power to borrow, or in fact, there couldn't be a mortgage over an asset that the super fund owned. But that's now changed. Okay, so now let me talk to um, the people who have got a number of investment properties already. Yep. And let's say we've got one chap that owns 30 investment properties, but let's say you own two investment properties. Mm -hmm. Would you give advice to sell one, put the equity into the other property and put that into a super? Would you kind of look at the holistic picture? Yeah. Or, or what do you do? Uh, you have to look at the overall plan, what our clients, where their situation is now and what they want to ultimately achieve. Um, and if property is the ultimate investment they see as creating wealth for their long term, then a super fund is generally the way to go, uh, particularly those that move into the 55 years of age. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't realise that they can actually uh, put their investments in a tax-free world. From what age? From 55. Right, so it's not 65 retirement age? No, so say, some, uh, to, so say someone is 40, 45, um, buys a block of shops on Kensington Road, yep. and then uh, that there's an escalation, they've bought it for the capital growth, and then they hit 55 and think, well, I want to sell it, it would be better to have it in the super fund because then there is actually no capital growth to the term that they've owned the property. Right, so what about people that need cash flow? Are they best not to be in a super? Well, super, um, super fund actually works well there too because the employer is contributing 9% of your gross salary. In, okay. So you can actually do your top-ups or any shortfall on your rental income right. just, just by your employer contributions. Duncan, we'll come back to this, um, but let's go now and see Phil Ely and um, see what his thoughts are about some of the um, financial matters that surround property owners.